Hello, Saddleback. It's good to see all of you. You might know that uh, Shondell, my wife, and I have been at Saddleback 25 years now. A lot of you said kind, kind things about it this last week. This weekend happens to be my 60th birthday weekend, so I'm really on a roll with these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Be kind to the old man. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you guys, if you had told me as a young man that I would have gotten to do some of the things I've gotten to do, gotten to teach some of the places I've gotten to teach, some of the ways I've gotten to teach, if you told me I'd gotten to lead some of the ways I've gotten to lead or be involved in some of the things I've gotten to be involved in, I would have highly doubted you. I was, uh, as a young man, very willing to do whatever God asked me to do. I really had this heart, God, whatever you want me to do, but in my heart of hearts, I would have told you, even though I knew I should be expecting something different, that God would probably use me in small ways, insignificant ways. Not that small has to be insignificant, but that's just the way that I, I felt. I just, well, he, he may want to use me in humble ways. I became a follower of Jesus later in life. I had a lot to learn. So I just thought, well, he'll do these little things with my life. And I think maybe that's why I'm attracted to the story of the guy we're going to look at together this weekend. And what he has to teach us about, how do you live a significant life? A significant life is not always the most noticed life or the biggest life, but it is a significant life. It is a meaningful life. And the life of Gideon in the Old Testament teaches us some things about how to live this significant life, this life that God made us for. We're starting a look this week at some of the lesser known people in the Old Testament and what we, what we can learn from them. In the Old Testament, there's like the big three. There's Abraham, there's Moses, there's David. We talk a lot about these, these guys. There's also a lot of other men and women that we can learn some very significant things from. And Gideon is one of them. Now, I, I just gotta get this out of the way right at the beginning. God, Gideon is not the guy who puts Bibles in hotel rooms. That's not who we're talking about here. That's the name of the organization that named themselves after Gideon because they saw some things in his life that they wanted to emulate. And that's why I'm also attracted to him because there's some things in his life that show us how to live a significant life. When you look at Gideon's life, his life shows you and I how to face, how to find some victory in the three greatest battles we're all gonna have to face when it comes to living this significant life, when it comes to living out the potential and the promise that God made you for. And when you look at Gideon, he shows you that that can change in your life, that you can begin to live with a new pen potential, a new promise. Because most of us, let's just face it, many, many people do not live out the full potential that God made them to live out, do not live out the full promise that God made them for. Gideon shows us that can change. And in showing us, Gideon is a man who struggled. Gideon was not a perfect guy. He was a man who struggled with deep insecurities. He was a man who doubted again and again that God would do what he, would, what he had promised. But even in the midst of all of that, you see in Gideon this man who becomes the greatest faith leader in his generation. Now, how does that happen? Well, it's because he knew how to face these battles. And my prayer and as we look at his, is that as we look at his story together, God will help you to see how to live this significant life. Whether you have thought that could never be me, or you began to live it and you need to sort of regain it, or you're in the middle of it and you just need some encouragement along the way. I hope that Gideon's story helps every one of us. What are the three major areas of life where we've got to make some choices that determine whether we're going to live a significant life, the promise, the potential that God has for us? Area number one is this. I have to discover, you have to discover your identity. That's where it starts. You, you begin by discovering your identity. This comes first because you have to know who you are before you can do what God made you to do. Harry Truman, who is the American president, I think, who reminds me of Gideon a lot, I think much because he came to leadership late in life out of relative obscurity like Gideon did, he once said this, in reading the lives of great men, I have found that the first victory they won was over themselves. And that's true. There's this inner battle about who I am, how I face life, who I expect God to you, what I expect God to do through my life that we all have to face. Look at how it happened in Gideon's life. It's in Judges chapter six. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, 
mighty hero, the Lord is with you. So God's going to help Gideon discover his identity, just like he wants to help you to discover your identity. And in reading his story, you're going to see that there's a way that does not work to discover your identity, who you really are, and there's a way that doesn't work. Let's look at both of them, beginning with how it doesn't work to discover identity. Here's how it doesn't work. You look at your circumstances. If you look at your circumstances to try to figure out who you are, that doesn't work. Gideon's the perfect example of what happens when you let your circumstances determine who you are. He and all the Israelites had been under seven years of oppression from this group, this invading army called the Midianites. And what they would do was, they're, they're a bigger group than the Israelites, they had better weapons. So when the crops would come in for the Israelites, the Midianites would come in just as the crops came in, and before they could harvest them, they would take all of their food and take it back to their country. So they're a very weak, starving people through all of this. And Gideon is facing the reality of this in this wine press. He's working in a wine press, threshing out grain so that the invading armies don't see him, so maybe he can eke out just a little bit of food. He's working in this wine press, and he does not exactly look like a natural-born leader. He's supposed to be the greatest military hero of his day, and he's hiding out in a wine press. Truth of the matter is, this is a picture, because a lot of us work in a wine press. It's a picture of hiding from your potential in some task, something that needs to be done that's right in front of you. There's some potential, some promise in your life. You may even know about it, have some inkling of it, but you hide out from it. In some little task, something that needs to be done. That's what Gideon's doing here. He's hiding out from fighting the battle in the wine press. And you might be hiding out from what God wants to do in your life. Deep inside, you know God has this challenge. He has this dream. He has this potential. He has this promise for your life. But you're hiding out in the wine press. You feel the challenge and you think, well... I'll, uh, I'll organize my desk. That's what I'm going to do this week instead. Well, let's remodel our house. Let's do that. Not that it's wrong to remodel your house or organize the desk. Not saying that. What I'm saying is we tend to hide out in little tasks sometimes from this potential, this promise that God wants to do something in our lives. Well, God shows up. God shows up to tell Gideon in the midst of a wine press that he wants to do something in his life. And the truth of the matter is, when I look at my life, I've hidden out in a wine press many times. I can find many times in my life when God's brought a new challenge and instead of chasing after it, I've drawn back from it. And God, in his grace, in his love, continues to tell us that he wants that challenge, that dream to happen in your life. You might be hiding out right now. You might be hiding out from getting married. And the reason you're hiding out, the reason we all hide is because we're afraid. The reason the, one of the most common commands in the Bible is fear not is because guess what? We get afraid as human beings. And so because of our fears, we hide out from the relationship of marriage and what it could mean in our lives. Maybe in some significant task, maybe in some job, you're hiding out from that dream, that promise of God in your life. Or maybe what you're hiding out from is a new career and you're really involved in the job you're doing now, but you haven't been fulfilled for years and you're hiding out in that job from what God really wants you to do. That's hiding in a wine press. Or maybe you're hiding from sharing your faith in some ministry, something you're doing here at the church. Or maybe you're hiding from some God-given dream. And in doing some small task, important, it's good that it's done, but you know, and in your heart, you know, I'm hiding in what I'm doing right now. The reason we hide is we're afraid, but the good news is God knows that, and he shows up. Here's, here's the great news in this story to me. God finds Gideon in the wine press. It's not like he was hiding from God. He might have been hiding from himself, from the enemy, from everybody else. It's not like he was hiding from God. God finds Gideon in the wine press. He'll find you wherever you are. He'll find you in your fear. There's no fear that can keep God from finding us. Now, it's still our cho choice, but God calls fearful people. And when he does that, in that moment, the choice is, am I gonna trust my human fear, or am I going to trust my heavenly Father? It's one of the most important choices of life. It really determines the promise, the potential for your life. Am I going to trust my human fear, or am I going to trust my heavenly Father? Now, you can stay in the wine press. You can let the circumstances of your life determine the identity of your life, or you can make an entirely different choice. And it's the choice that God challenged in Gideon's life as an example for us, because he wants all of us to have this same choice. 
Here's the right choice when it comes to determining your identity. You listen to what God says about you. If you let your circumstances tell you who you are, you're gonna be messed up because sometimes you're gonna have good circumstances, sometimes bad circumstances. They can never tell you the true promise for your life. So instead, you listen to what God says about you. Here's Gideon. It's a day like any other the last seven years, and he's just trying to survive. And God shows up. And God calls this frightened man in a wine press a mighty hero. Did you notice that? Mighty hero. Gideon had to think, is somebody in the wine press with me? Because this can't be me. I'm the guy that's hiding out. God's talking about his potential. God's talking about the promise of what he wants to do in his life. You are a mighty hero. And God loves to do this. You see him doing this all through the Bible. He shows up and he says to Abraham, I'm gonna name you Abraham, which means father of nations, father of multitudes, when he doesn't have any kids. He's talking about the promise of what he wants to do in his life. Or Jesus does it with a disciple by the name of Simon. He says, I'm gonna rename you Peter, which means the rock. When Simon Peter was the most impetuous of all the disciples, he says, you're a rock. I'm gonna build some things on you. He sees his potential. He sees the promise of what God wants to do in his life. And the same thing is true of you. Some of you, you woke up today, a day like any other day, but in the next few minutes, God's gonna say something to you about who you are, who you really are. And when you hear that, not from me, but from him, when you hear that from him, it changes everything. Everything about you, everything about your future. You don't look any different, but you see differently. It's not enough, it's not enough to convince yourself that you've got potential. That's a good thing, but it's not enough. Because then it's all based on you and how much you feel, how much strength you have. No, you got to hear what God has to say about you. So my question to you is, what would surprise you? What would it surprise you to hear God say to you? Because when Gideon hears, you're a mighty hero, that had to be a surprise. What would it, if God said this to you, you'd think, oh, that's for the person sitting next to me. I must have just overheard it because that certainly can't mean me. What would it surprise you to hear? That's probably the thing you most need to hear. Maybe it's deeply loved. Some of you need to hear that. And you think you're the last person in the world that's deeply loved because everything in your circumstances has told you nobody loves you. Everyone's rejected you. Everyone's gone away from you. No one's been faithful to you. You don't feel loved in any way. But God shows up in the person of Jesus Christ and he says to you, I want you to understand how deeply loved you are by me even if no human being ever expresses that love to you. You are deeply loved. And if you're thinking right now, I'm, I, I'm the last person in the world that that applies to, you're the person that needs to hear it. Or maybe what you need to hear God say to you right now is that you're a man of faith, a woman of faith. And you're thinking, oh, not that, that's, that one is for the guy next to me. That is definitely not me. There's a lot of things, strengths I've got in my life. Faith is not one of them. And I'm here to tell you, God wants to change the world through your faith. I have no doubt about that. Now, it might be noticed by others. It might not be noticed, but I am absolutely certain God wants to change the world through your faith because he tells us that. It's not based on my promise. It's based on his promise. If you think I could never be a great man of faith or a great woman of faith, you're the very person who needs to hear God saying to you right now, you're a man of faith. You're a woman of faith. He wants to work in your life. Maybe what you need to hear God say to you right now is eternally forgiven. You look at your past and you think of the things that you've done and you, you think, even if everybody else in this room could be forgiven, I'm the one person who could not be forgiven. When the truth of the matter is, none of us deserve forgiveness. None of us. But it's a gift that's given to us by Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. And you need to hear God say that about you right now and accept that gift of forgiveness. Maybe what you need to hear God say to you right now is significant servant. You are a gifted servant. You think you're the person who is not gifted. You just help the people who are like gifted servants. I'll just walk along behind and I'll just help people out. I'll just do the things that nobody else wants to do. When the truth of the matter is, the things that nobody else wants to do, you do in those things, that's the most significant service that you could possibly do. That's the service that's gonna shout the way all, its way all the way into eternity. Maybe you need to hear God saying that to you. Or maybe it's something I haven't even said. 
truth of the matter is, God's the one who's speaking right now. What's he saying in your mind? What's he saying in your heart about who you are? When you hear it, and when you begin to let that, that help you to discover your identity, that's when you begin to discover all that God made you for, the promise that he made you for. The question is, my life, your life, in any given moment, is your life being determined by your view of you or by God's view of you? And if you're like me, it's up, up and down. Sometimes it's my view of me, and then I, okay, and then it's God's view of me. And then I go back and forth with that. As long as you're letting your life be determined by your view of you, your circumstances, you're never gonna live up to the potential, the promise that God has for your life. It can only be found by God's view of you because only he sees all that he wants to do in your life. That's what Gideon was learning that day. So it's, that's where it starts, with discovering your identity. And then the second big area of victory of battle is this. Second thing you gotta do is you have to decide your activity. Once you know who you are, you have to decide, what am I gonna do about it? So when Gideon hears God's promise for his life, this is interesting, a lot like us, when he hears God's promise for his life, his first reaction is not, oh, that's great, I've always known that's what I'm supposed to do. No, his first reaction is first to doubt that God is even speaking to him. Oh, this is just a human being speaking to me. And second, to be frustrated that it hasn't worked out earlier, that he's having struggles in his life. So God says, mighty hero to him, and all the frustration spills out of Gideon. Look at what he has to say. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, and he's handed us over to the Midianites. And then the Lord said to him, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. So look at this. It all spills out. All this frustration, all the ways that God had let him, all of his countrymen down, everything that wasn't working. Gideon saying, God, this isn't working. This isn't working. This is why it won't work. And in all of his complaints, he's totally missing something. He's completely missing the fact that God wants to use him, Gideon, to be the solution to everything he's complaining about. Why is it that you notice certain things that are wrong? Why is it that you notice certain problems or certain things that aren't working? Why is it that you get frustrated about certain things? It's not because God wants somebody else to solve that. It's because he wants to use you as a part of the solution. You and I, we notice things that aren't working and we think, is everybody else stupid? Don't they see this? No, they're not stupid. It's just that we're all wired differently. We're all called differently. And the fact that that you notice a problem doesn't mean somebody else is supposed to solve that problem. The very fact that you're wired to notice it means God wants to use you as a part of the solution. That's what Gideon's learning this day. Now, when it comes to launching out, doing something about it, I, I know who I am, now I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna act on it. It's the same as with our identity. There's a way that doesn't work and there's a way that does work. What doesn't work is to wait for strength that you don't have. It doesn't work to say, okay, I know I'm supposed to do something, and when I get the strength, then I'm gonna act. The truth is, it's pretty easy to see the strength that you don't have. And because of that, one of the great traps of life, and some of you are in this trap right now, is the wait till I have more trap. You, you, you think to yourself, when I have enough money, then I'll act. When I have more time, then I'll act. When I have more energy, then I'll act. When I get more help, then I'll act. And you can end up waiting the rest of your life for something that's never gonna come. No, you don't, you don't wait for strength you don't have. You do what God told Gideon to do that day. Here's what does work when it comes to acting in faith. You go in the strength that you do have. You go in the strength that you do have. You notice God says two important things to Gideon. He says, you go in the strength that you have. Am I not sending you? We, we tend to say, okay, God, here, here's how this is gonna work. I'm willing to do something, but first you prove yourself and then I'll do it. So God, first you give me the financial windfall and then I'll become a great giver. That's how this is gonna work, God. Or we say, God, first you give me this super abundant energy and then I'll serve you with that energy. Or God, first you give me more love from other people than I could possibly handle and then I'll pass that love along to other people. But it never works that way. 
We want more than enough before we get started. God says, no, just what you have is enough. Start with what you have. That's the step of faith. You go in the strength that you have. But in this conversation we have with God about this, we say, no, I'd rather have more than enough. So God, I'm just gonna sit here and wait until you give me more than enough and then I'll get started. Here's the problem. You never wanna get caught up in waiting on God because God is very patient. <laughs> God is from everlasting to everlasting. He has a lot more time than you do. You don't wanna get caught up in this game. Now, it, if God was all about giving you more than you not needed, more than enough, then he would have already given it to you. But he's more about building your faith. He's more about using you in spite of your lacks. He's more about building your relationship with him. And so instead of getting caught in that game of waiting, you do what God challenged Gideon to do. You go in the strength that you have. You start where you are. One of the great Christian leaders of the previous generation, sort of the Rick Warren of his generation, was Ray Steadman. He's always been a mentor of mine from afar. He was uh, one of the leaders of the time that encouraged a lot of the leaders around the country, one of the people who first encouraged small groups and everybody being involved in ministry. I'll never forget reading his sermon that ended up being the last sermon that he preached to his church before he died. He didn't know he was going to die. It just happened to work out that way. And in that sermon, he talked about how God had used him, how God had surprised him by using him in so many ways through his life to serve so many people. And he talked about how to take that step of faith. And here's what he said. Many people never discover what God could do in their lives because they keep waiting to feel powerful before they act. No, you won't feel powerful. Begin to reach out and act to meet the needs that are around you, and suddenly you discover that there's unusual power at work. So if you're waiting to feel some kind of, okay, I'm super spiritually powered in my life, and I just can't help but by, by this power do whatever God's called me to do, you're gonna wait the rest of your life. No, you go in the strength that you have. That's how faith works. That's how God works. That's what Gideon learned from God that day about how to live a significant life. Stop waiting for what you don't have. Start using whatever God's given you right now. That's how you're gonna live the promise that he's put into your life. And then Gideon faces a third major battle, third major area of life. And that is, you have to determine your capacity. First, you have to know who you are, your identity. Then you have to know what you're gonna do. And then you gotta know, what am I gonna do it with? Determine your capacity. Where are you gonna find the time? Where are you going to find the energy? Where are you going to find the money, the ideas to do what God has called you to do? For a lot of us, this right here, this is the main issue. We, we know who we are. We know what we're supposed to be doing. But the truth of the matter is, we don't know where we're going to find the resources to do it all. And again, we've got a choice. There's something that doesn't work. There's something that does work with this one. What doesn't work is to rely on your resources. Just rely on whatever you have. There's a pattern here I'm sure you can see. Whenever you rely just on you, you're gonna miss out on the promise that God has for your life. So if it's your perspective, your strength, your resources, obviously it's not as great as his perspective, his strength, his resources. That's where the promise is. That's where the significance is. Now, God wants to use your strength. God wants to use your resources, but he doesn't want you to rely on your strength and resources because it's just a part of what God wants to do in your life. But the problem is, it's easier to rely on our resources because it's easier, well, for one thing, to see our resources than to see God, than to see faith. It's easier to see how much is in your bank account than to see how much God's gonna do for you when you pray that prayer. So it's easier to rely on our resources. And for another thing, we control our resources and we tend to like that. We like to be in control. Your resources are never gonna ask you to do something you don't wanna do. God often asks us to do something we don't wanna do because he's stretching us, he's growing us. So because of that, we tend to wanna rely on just on our resources. It's the safe place to stay. But it's the place that's apart from God's promise, apart from God's potential for your life. So you don't rely on your resources. There's a different choice you make in order to watch God do the greatest things in your life. And this is where the greatest surprise comes in the story of Gideon. This is where the greatest surprise comes in many of our lives. You'd think, well, it's not rely on 
my resources, let's rely on God's resources. But the truth is, God wants to use you. He's still working through you. So instead of relying on your resources, what you do is you watch God use your weaknesses. You watch God use your weaknesses. That's where your greatest promise is. That's where the greatest potential for your life is. Now, your weaknesses, what am I talking about here? It's any place that it's evident to you that you don't have the resources to do what God's asking you to do. It could be a lack of ability. It could be a lack of energy or a lack of experience. It could be a physical or an emotional or a spiritual handicap. It could be some hurt from your past. It could be some anxiety about your future. Something that makes you know, well, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I don't have it in me to do this. And we think, what we tend to think is, when I get rid of that weakness, then God can do something great in my life. So I'm gonna work to get rid of that weakness and then he'll do something great. But God says, no, no. I can use you even in that weakness. And the greatest surprise of all, I can use you even through that weakness. Through even that, I can show the world something about how great I am. Now, I want you to look with me at how God taught Gideon this truth, because in this story, we can learn some things about ourselves and what God wants to do in our lives. In Judges chapter seven, Gideon is about to go up against an army of 135,000, we learn later in the book of Judges, with only 32,000. He's gotten 32,000 into his army. And God says to him, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strengths. So in what I think is one of the funniest stories in the entire Bible, God's about to reduce Gideon's army from 32,000 down to 300. He's gonna reduce the army to the level of total dependence on God. He's gonna give them some pride insurance because as he tells them here, they need more than a victory. They need to know that God is the one who gives them this victory. And that might have been clouded by 32,000. It's not gonna be clouded by 300. So, and you can read this later if you wanna go read it in the book of Judges, but let me just tell you how this happened. God brings the army down to a smaller size. He does a couple things. First, he says, Gideon, tell everybody, if anybody doesn't feel like fighting today, you can go home. Well, they're already 32,000 against 135,000 certain deaths. Hey, anybody not want to die today, you can go home. 22,000 people went home. It's amazing to me, 10,000 stayed. I can't believe 10,000 stayed. But 22,000 immediately went home. So Gideon's saying, all right, God, obviously we're just depending on you. And God says, no, I wanna make this very clear to you. So let's do this test. And this test will tell you who's gonna be in the army and who's not. And I'm sure Gideon's thinking, great, some warrior's test, like you know, spear throwing or like you know, bow shooting, some kind of a test like that. And God says, no, no, here's the test. Take everybody down to the water and watch how they drink. Some people are gonna lie flat on their belly and just drink right out of the stream. Other people are gonna get some water and they're gonna drink that way. And God says, Gideon, I want you to take the guys, not the guys, that's who I want you to take. And Gideon's going, what kind of test is this? What does this tell me? And I've, heard, I've read some commentators who say, the guys who lapped the water, they were the better warriors because they were looking around. That doesn't have anything to do it, with it at all. The reason God said to take those guys is only 300 people did that. He's going for the smallest number possible. Gideon's facing an army of 135,000 with 300 people. How in the world is victory gonna happen? Well, look at this verse up on the screen. Here's how it happened. Gideon divided the 300 men into three groups, and he gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle the enemy, and you take the torch, you put the clay jar over it, you take the horn, and that, the signal that Gideon gives, break the torch so that the light shines out, break the jar so that the torch shines out and blow the bugle. So it will seem to the army that they're immediately surrounded by a bigger army. And I'll confuse them and they'll fight each other and that's the way the victory is gonna be won. Now, how in the world did that work? Only by God's power. I'm sure every one of them. Uh, can you imagine being one of the 300? I'm standing here with my torch and my bugle against 135. I'm thinking, this is not gonna work. There's no way this is gonna work. 
but they all obeyed. And because they all obeyed, God brought them this incredible victory in this moment. He used them even in their weakness. He made very clear to them that even in their weakness, he could use them when they did what he asked them to do. That's the story that's here. This fact that God can use us even in our weaknesses, that's why when I talk to leaders here, leaders of other churches, I almost always try to share with them the struggles I've had all my life with insecurity, sometimes crippling insecurity. Insecurity that kept me from stepping out in faith or kept me from trusting God in that area. If I got to trust in God, made it take too long to trust in God in that area. And you could point to things in my life, like growing up with a dad who suffered from severe mental illness, was in and out of mental hospitals. There's, there's things you could point to psychologically of why this would be in a person's life. But the truth of the matter is it's something I've had to face in my life. And I've had to decide, am I gonna trust God in spite of this? Or am I gonna wait until it goes away to trust God? I used to think I'll just wait till it goes away and then I'll trust God. And I found out it's not gonna go away like I want it to. So the question is, am I going to trust him even in my weakness? Question for you, for all of us, is am I going to trust him now? Even in my weaknesses, am I going to trust him? You see, God has this process that he does in our lives. That he uses our weaknesses to show his glory, to bring him glory. And this story we're looking at with Gideon it is a story that the process that's talked about here, you see it again and again and again and again in the Bible. God wants us to get this one. Some of the most famous stories in the Bible are about how God works through this process. Through our weaknesses, he shows how great he is. A couple of verses in your outline. 1 Samuel 17. So David defeated the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. He hit him and he killed him. He did not even have a sword in his hand. The story of David and Goliath is an illustration of this process. Or from the New Testament, here's a boy with just five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Well, Jesus shows them. Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. The feeding of the 5,000 is a picture of this same process of how God does this. Or the story we're looking at now. With these five, 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Now, I want to take just a couple of minutes to explain this process. Because if you don't understand it, you're going to be constantly confused about what God's doing in your life. It's going to constantly feel like he is working against you than working for you to do great things in your life. It's one of the key processes to understand when it comes to faith. When God wants to do something great in your life, what does he do? How does he do it? We have an idea of how he should do it. He doesn't do it that way at all. When God wants to do something great in your life, here's the process that he takes you through. Number one, God reduces our resources. Now we think if God's gonna do something great, he's gotta give me more resources. That's not how it happens. He reduces our resources. It could be financial resources or energy resources or emotional resources. He reduces our resources. It could be just by being aware of how little we had in the first place. That's what happened in the feeding of the 5,000. They go out to find out how much food they have. Five loaves and two fish in 5,000 people. They got nothing. How are they going to feed everybody? Now, I know in this world, it seems like as human beings, some of us have more resources than others. But the question is, how, much, how many resources do we have compared to God to do all that God wants to do in our lives? God is able to use small beginnings now, why does God do this? Why does he reduce our resources? He told Gideon why he was doing it before he did it, because he doesn't want us to mistake where the power is coming from. He doesn't do it without us. He wants to do it through us, but he wants us to understand that the power is coming from him. He reduces our resources in order to magnify his power, because that's how something significant is going to happen in your life. If I live life just based on my resources, there's not much I'm going to be able to do. The more I can live life based on his resources, the greater, the more significant, the more powerful and promised life I can live. And so to help us to see that, God often reduces our resources. And as, if that were not enough, the next thing he does is he magnifies our need. He lets us see how little we have, and then he lets us see how great the problem is. 
He magnifies our need. An army of 135,000, 5,000 to be fed, a giant called Goliath, or whatever problem you're facing in your life. You see how big the problem really is. Let me ask you a question. Why doesn't God make our lives easier? I mean, why, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he give us more than enough money? It would sure make things easier, wouldn't it? Why didn't he give you more than enough time or more than enough energy? Why in the world doesn't he? He could. He's God. I think deep down, intuitively, we all know the answer. If my life was easier, if I had more than enough, I'd trust myself. I wouldn't trust God. That's what we tend to do as human beings. And so God magnifies the need so that we trust in him. He allows the need to be very evident, and he allows the resources to be very lacking so that this moment will happen. This is the moment when everything changes. This is the moment when your life takes a turn. It might be very apparent to somebody else. You might only know it in this moment. And some of you, it's gonna happen right now in the next few minutes. In this moment where you see, I don't have enough and there's too much to be done, what causes significance? What causes promise? It's the third step. The third step is somebody trusts God with what little they have. Somebody trusts God with the little that they have. This is the principle of obedience. Whether it's David or a little boy with his lunch, this is the principle of obedience. What we wanna do is we wanna sit and we wanna wait for somebody to show up that has more than enough to meet the need. And when that person shows up, then we'll go and do whatever God's asked us to do. Never happens that way. Instead, what God does is he waits for somebody who doesn't have enough, but they trust God with what little they have. It always starts, it always starts with somebody who trusts God with what little they have. And that's you and that's me. Where do you need to trust God with the little that you have? With Gideon's army, they set aside their swords and their spears in favor of bugles and torches and clay jars. They trusted God with what little they had. Now, why was this approach so effective? Because it was based on obedience to what God had told them to do. On saying yes to God with the little that they had. In the 10 years before I came here to Saddleback, I was pastor at a church in Northern California in Marysville. In that small church, the church grew a little and I grew a lot. And uh, one of the great lessons of faith I had was when a disaster hit our community. We had a flood that hit our community, destroyed a lot of our community. The story was that Shondell and I were getting ready for a women's study that she was gonna do at our house that night, so I decided to take her out before the study to a fine dining experience at Carl's Jr. So we, uh, we drove across the bridge and in, into town and saw that the water was still near the top of the levees. And we thought, well, it looks like it's gone down a little bit. It looks like, uh, looks like we're gonna be okay. It's not gonna come up over the top. Went and we're eating a hamburger and all of a sudden the restaurant just emptied out. Everybody left. We said, what's going on? We got up and went to the counter and they said, oh, a levee broke over on the other side of town and it's flooding the other side of town. But they said, you don't have to worry because it's not on this side of town, it's on the other side of town. And we said, we do have to worry. Our house is on the other side of town. Our church is on the other side of town. And the truth is that water came in and nine feet of water in our house, the church that we were meeting in at the time was destroyed. Shondell and I, all we had left was the car we were driving and the clothes on our back. And we we drove our Chevy to the levee and the levee was dry. I mean, it happened to us. That is our song, no doubt about it. That's our song. This community that we were in, it was a poor community. A lot of people just struggling to get by, a lot of retired people. And we had to decide, are we still gonna be a church? I'll never forget meeting at Mary Lou's house with about 15 leaders of the church. And I knew what I wanted but they had to decide it was their church. Are we still gonna be a church? I'll never forget those people's faith. These people who had very little saying, this community needs a church. This community needs to see the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ. So we're gonna take what little we have and we're gonna say, yes, we're still gonna be a church. So we met in a community college for a couple of years. We eventually were able to buy land and build a building. And there's a church in that community today because those people trusted God with what little they had. That moment, I saw that moment in their lives. 
That's the history of Saddleback Church. One of the things that actually disturbs me about our church is how big we are in our main campus now. I mean, God's blessed us and that's wonderful, but the truth of the matter is, you don't see in this the fact that the only reason any of this is here is because there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who have trusted God with what little they had. That's why this is here. Now, it was easy to see in the early days when we were meeting in rented facilities. It was easy to see when we were meeting in an open air tent And at our campuses now, at our regional campuses, it's still easy to see as you guys are setting up and taking down every weekend. You can see it. Don't ever miss the fact that whatever God's doing, it started because somebody said, I'm gonna trust God with what little I have. How do you need to do that? Because when that happens, the fourth thing happens. When someone does that, number four, God uses the little that we have to show how great he is. He uses the little we have to show how great he is. So an entire army fights each other in panic, and those who were not killed run away, and Gideon wins the battle that day. And if you think this was because of his brilliant military strategy, you don't understand military strategy. This was very poor strategy. If one person had seen these guys standing around with the bugles, and does this sound like good military strategy to you? Bugles and pots and torches. This is not good strategy, but God knew the hearts of the enemy. Because God knew their hearts, God knew that they could win this victory. And because they obeyed him, God used the little that they had to show how great he is. There's a cycle I can fall into, and maybe some of you, same happens to you. I I trust God with what little I have, And God takes it. He promises, and he does some things with it. And as he does some things with it, you can start to feel a little bit confident. Wow, look at that. Start to feel better about yourself. Start to feel better about what you could do by yourself. And based on that, you start trusting in yourself instead of trusting the God who first took what little you had and did all this in the first place. Let me just encourage you. Remember this truth, that my strength tends to pull me away from God's strength, but my weakness tends to tends to draw me towards God's strength. And the truth is, no matter how much or how little you think you have right now, compared to God's greatness, it's little in the first place. So wherever you are on that scale of little or great, right now, trust him. Right now, trust him. Some of you, you've been given a lot in this world compared to other people, but that's not who we're comparing to, is it? What we're talking about is the potential and promise that God has for your life. And if you let your life be determined by comparing to other people that are around you, how much, how little you have, you're gonna miss out. You're gonna entirely miss out on the great promise that God has for what he wants to do through you, through your faith in this world. God wants to use what little we have to show how great he is, even through our weaknesses. The Bible talks about this many places. Probably most famous place is when the Apostle Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He talks about some weakness that he had. He doesn't tell us what it is. We think maybe it was a physical ailment, but we don't know. But he says, I've got this weakness, and I asked God three times that he'd take it away from me. He hasn't taken it away. So instead, here's what God said to me about it. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak then I am strong. Strong because now he's trusting in God. Strong because now he's connected to where the real power source is. Paul tells us here, he lines it out for us. What do you do with your weaknesses? Tells us exactly what to do. First he says, pray that they might be removed. Don't just accept them and say, okay, God wants me to live with this the rest of my life. It's okay to pray that they might be removed. He says, I prayed earnestly three times that they would be removed, but God said no. So pray that they might be removed, and praise God if he does remove that weakness in this world. In heaven, it's gonna be gone. In heaven, it will be gone, but praise God if he removes it in this world. But even if he doesn't, Paul says, here's the second thing you do. You boast in that weakness. A weakness does not automatically become a strength. It doesn't automatically become faith. Something has to happen. And Paul says the way it happens is you boast in that weakness. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean we go out on the patio afterwards and say, well, my weakness is better than your weakness. I got a bigger weakness than you do. No, that's not what this is about. This is a positive boasting. This is the kind of boasting you've had, not prideful boasting, but positive boasting. The kind of boasting you'd have like in one of your kids. 
They're, they're like doing something in, uh, in some, some kind of singing thing at, at, at school. They're doing some kind of sports thing out on the, out on the field. And you see them do something, and you think, that's my kid, that moment. And Paul's saying, I can boast, not in the fact that there's a weakness, but in the fact that God can use even that. He can work in my life even in spite of that, and he can work in my life even through that weakness. You can find joy in the fact that God can work in your life in spite of your weaknesses and even through your weaknesses. And there's a picture in the New Testament about this that attaches to the picture we just looked at in the story of Gideon. Remember the clay jars, those weak, fragile clay jars that were used when they were broken, the light shone out? Look at this picture in the New Testament because in the New Testament, we're the clay jars. God wants to shine his light out through your life. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, but we have this treasure, the treasure of God's grace, the treasure of God's goodness, the treasure of salvation. We have this treasure in jars of clay, fragile, weak jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You want to do great things for God? You're going to face great weaknesses. Of course that's true. Think of how great God is compared to who we are. When I get connected to him, I'm going to notice who I really am, that I have a lot of weaknesses. Want to do great things for God? You're going to face great weaknesses. I like the first part, doing great things. I don't like the second part, facing my weaknesses. I don't like it. But the truth of the matter is, the more I have learned to boast and to take joy in the fact that God can use even that, the more I've begun to discover the potential, the promise that God has for my life. And that's true for every one of us. The more you begin to recognize that God wants to work even in the midst of your weaknesses, the more you discover the promise that he has for your life. And then the fifth thing happens. Number five, God works through us to accomplish his will. It's not that he says, okay, you trust me and then I'll go do it and you get to watch. No, he makes us a part of it. So the feeding of the 5,000, the bread comes through the disciples' hands. They get to hand it out. They're part of it. The defeat of Goliath, the stone goes into David's sling. He gets to be part of that victory. The army of Gideon, they're the ones standing there with the torches and clay pots and bugles. They're all a part of it. And God wants you to be a part of his victory. God wants you to be a part of the great things that he wants to do in life. The lesson of Gideon's life, the man who we met hiding in a wine press, and who ends up defeating an entire army with only 300 men. The lesson of Gideon's life is all about how God wants to use our weaknesses, where he finds us and where he wants to take us. Let me put that lesson up on the screen. You might want to write this down. The lesson is, I want to hide in my weaknesses in the wine press. I want to hide in my weaknesses, but God wants to use my weaknesses. Even that, even there. That's where the great promise is. That's where the great potential is. Now, before we end, I want to look back just for a second at a conversation that Gideon had with God just when God was telling him, I want to do some great things in your life. Because I have a feeling that this, is, this conversation is exactly what some of you are feeling right now. God comes to Gideon and says, I want to do great things in your life. And Gideon says, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. I know that some of you right now, you're thinking this entire message, it was for somebody else, not you. Because you're the least, you're the last person that this could apply to. Anything about faith, anything about significance, that's just not you. And if you're feeling that way, that's exactly what Gideon was feeling. If you're feeling that way, God has a message for you. Because the truth of the matter is, we look at our lives and we think, how in the world am I going to be a person of faith? I've tried it before. I've fallen flat on my face. I've failed. How am I going to live that kind of a life? We've all failed, by the way. If you have a fear of failure, I've got some good news for you. It's not going to sound like good news at first, but it's some good news. Here's the good news. You will fail. That's how you face the fear of failure. That's the good news. You're a human being. We're all going to fail. 
And because of that, we gotta face the fact that we're gonna have failures in this life and not let those become fears that control us. Do not let your failures become a fear that controls you for the rest of your life. God says, I know you're gonna have failures. Gideon, not a perfect man, had plenty of failures in his life, but God wanted to do something through him. You're not a perfect man or woman. God wants to do something through your life. God wants to do something in your life. Here's two simple truths about life. You will fail, but God will never fail you. God will never fail you. So you need to hear what Gideon needed to hear that day. Some of you, this is what you came here to hear today. God says, I will be with you. You're not facing this alone. God will be with you as you face this. Now, as we close, I wanna give you just a few minutes, just between you and God, to talk about what we've been talking about. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. And in your heart, would you just say, God, what do you wanna say to me about my identity? What words do I need to hear? And even if they surprise me, give me the faith to hear them. I don't want my life to be determined by my circumstances. I want to hear what you have to say about me. God, what do you want me to do? What activity do you want me to do with life? God, how could you use even my weakness? Uh, Like me, you may not have it all figured out yet. And what you need to do right now is just pray a prayer of faith. I invite you to join me in this prayer if it's your desire. Just say, Father, I want my identity to be determined not by the circumstances around me, but by what you say about me. That's what I want. And Father, I I wanna do what you've asked me to do. So instead of waiting for strength that I don't have, I wanna go in the strength that I have now. That's what I want. Make me that kind of man, that kind of woman. And say to him, Father, instead of trying to rely on my resources, I wanna watch you do the miracle of working even in the midst of my weaknesses, even through my weaknesses. I make that, even that available to you. That's what I want. In Jesus' name, I make this commitment. Amen. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.